Welcome to Edinburgh. Welcome here. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Exiled. Um, now that film is perhaps the third film in a, in a loose trilogy with Election, Election 2, and then Exiled. And it's set in Macau. Um, and I wonder whether you want to start by talking about your approach to shooting films around the, the, the kind of the gangster um, environment of Hong Kong and Macau, what your interest in that is. So I had no special interest in this area before we made Exiled. So after we filmed um, Election 1 and 2, I was actually very tired. There was too much information, too much to process, so I was personally quite tired. So I thought I would go to Macau to escape. <laughs> so I couldn't justify going to Macau for an escape without working, so we thought, let's make a film. <laughs> what should we make? Let's make Exiled. <laughs> and how... You know, Macau and Hong Kong have, have, a, have, have a similar kind of relationship to mainland China. Was this quite an interesting... Cause, and it's set in a very specific period, 1980, 1998. Um, and do you see that Macau and Hong Kong are quite similar or different? Or? Uh, Hong Kong and Hong Kong are actually the main so with Hong Kong and Macau both being colonial territories, I think their backgrounds are very similar. So they're both governed by foreigners, by foreign countries, but the people living in it, the population, are Chinese people. Mm. Um, so even though Hong Kong has a very large population, um, it's thanks to the UK's government that um, Hong Kong has become more successful and uh, has better living standards than Macau, I'd say. Mm. So Macau's economy is actually supported heavily by casinos and gambling. Mm. But it's mainly populated by Cantonese people, Hong Kong people. Mm. Mm. So the language is the same. Uh, yeah, yes. Mm. Mm. Yeah, the most important mm. is the language, the mm. shared language. Mm. Mm. And what about, and this is a bit of a kind of shifting our conversation a little bit towards what about, say, film cultures in those two countries? Now, in Hong Kong, growing up, um, what kind of films were you watching? What kind of films were you thinking about? And, and particularly, perhaps, films that were, were leading you towards thinking about films like Exiled. I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's perhaps make it. I loved watching films since I was a child. So, many times, these films, films, or people, so 
So when I'm attending film festivals or being interviewed and, and interviewers ask me um, why do you, did you start to make films, I really don't know how to answer because I never studied film, I never, I never went to school, mm. film school. And your first film you made in 1980, can you tell us about how, how you got into filmmaking from the very beginning? So I was a TV director before becoming a film film director, um, but it was always a really big hope of mine to become a film director. So I actually made my first film in 1978, and when I completed that film, I realized that I couldn't be a film director. And lots of people invited me to be to direct films, but I wasn't brave enough to take them on because I didn't feel like I could. It wasn't until 1986, um, about seven or eight years afterwards, that I felt like I could take that on again and, and direct a film. And so you started directing films and looking at your career, I mean, you, you've clearly directed many, many films, as if you're fans of John Toe will know that it's impossible to know just how many, but you've, on the one hand, you have quite a, um, a comic side, on the other hand, you have the, the, the films that you're famous for here, the, the, the policier, the gangster films, and also some uh, of the wuxia kind of sword play films as well, and where did you start in, in, the, ni- in, in the mid-1980s, 1986, did you, wh- which genre did you start working in? Mm. 在八六年之後,我去日本電影圈再拍電影的時候,很容易拍,感覺上,即不同我第一部戲的感覺完全,第一部我覺得電影很難拍,都到八六年之後再拍電影的時候,個電影很容易拍。So when I came back to making films in 1986, um, the film industry was different and it was actually very easy to make a film completely different experience to when I first started seven or eight years previously. So the only requirement that uh, you needed to make Hong Kong film was to make sure that you serviced the box office and it was commercially viable. Which made it very easy for us because all you had to do was get um, a famous star, a famous mm, actor mm. who had good box office results and your film would be successful. Mm, mm, because yeah. Uh, so this carried on until 1992 when I finished shooting a film not really sure if I should say this but a film with Stephen Chow and after I finished that film I thought I can't do this anymore because my life will end. So after that I 
moved, I basically moved from not knowing how to be a film director to finding, making a film very easy, to then discovering that I actually needed to really learn how to be a real film director. Sing that girl. Yeah. Yeah. ไม่ไม่ไกลเลยก็ยังสิงคโปร์ไม่ไม่ไกลเลยก็ยังสิงคโปร์ไม่ไกลเลยก็ยังสิงคโปร์ไม่ไกลเลยก็ยังสิงค
So a lot of people thought we needed to have an election in Hong Kong. Um, so this caused a lot of fighting in, in Hong Kong, a lot of arguing. So I guess what I wanted to say uh, with making this film was that before 1997, apart from political um, unrest, um, a lot of things changed, like our economy, the society, the discipline. And amongst all these changes, um, the one, the biggest change that I started to look at was the change within the triads. Um, and I realized that the history of the triads would be forgotten. So a lot of, um, I think that for the triads um, in Hong Kong, they, they very much belong to Hong Kong. Um, so we all see lots of heroic films or gangster films, but the triad genre very much belongs to Hong Kong. So um the stories that I knew um growing up in Hong Kong, I realized they wouldn't be recorded in the history books and nobody would really remember the triad's history or talk about it afterwards. Hmm. And I mean what what is so clear in, in, in films like Election and others is that the history of the triads is not only goes back hundreds of years as well, but is also, as you say, part of contemporary history. And do you, have you seen in your working career the, the triads change in their relationship to, to Hong Kong, but also the way in which the triads appear in films, both in your films and others? Has there been a change in the last? A big change. Uh, actually,我们第一集就是讲了，即系佢哋嘅，佢哋嘅诶一啲一啲喺诶，佢哋自己世界里边，黑社会嘅世界里边嘅斗争嚟嘅，只系。但系真正嚟讲，成个故事里边会
the difference between before 97 and after 97 is that the triad activity became less and less. Just before, so just a few years before 97, not in the 60s or 70s, but if the few years leading up to 97. So from then up to now, so the mid-2015, the majority of Hong Kong's triads have gone. Almost. Almost gone. But it's, it's because Ling Kai was gone. And I wondered why. Why have they almost all gone? 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 Why have And I wondered why, why, how come they, they didn't get rid of them? <coughs> and I mean, it's, and I was thinking, well, I wonder why. I was thinking that you, the, there's later films like Life Without Principle, mm. which are, which really look at contemporary capitalism, the banks, and, ev but money. Money is, you know, who's exploiting who, and that's in a way. Perhaps it starts the election, perhaps before that, that in a way the gangsters, the triads, and the banks and the money systems si. are the same. Si. And is this part of why, in a way, the triads have become or are the system? Is that what you might? Same. <laughs> Maybe the bankers are worse than the triads. <laughs> so the banks will cheat you out of your jacket. And then they see you're wearing a shirt under that, so they'll cheat you out of that. Under the shirt, you see you're wearing a vest, so they'll take that as well. But oh, you've still got your underpants on, and they'll cheat you out of that as well. In our understanding of the most safe, we were young. We thought that money was the most safe. So when I was little, um, we always thought of banks as being a security. Put, putting your money in a bank was the best and safest thing to do. But now, you will think that the most safe people are the thieves. Yeah. And now you realise that banks are actually robbers. They're, They're the only people who know exactly how much money you've got in the bank. They're the only people that really know how to take that money from you. Hmm. And so, who are the honest people left? And perhaps... <laughs> <laughs> and, and perhaps I'm thinking a, a little bit about the romances you've made, that there is something about everyday love, everyday family, that is perhaps outside of that, those big money systems, or whether, I mean, is, is that pushing it a bit too far? Gongfan,某孤的人,我的黑黑,黑,黑,黑,黑,黑,黑,黑,黑,黑,黑,黑,黑,黑,黑,黑,黑,黑,黑,黑,黑,黑,黑,黑,黑,黑,黑,黑,
，你會自己都會輕鬆啲嘅。So comedies, romantic comedies, are very difficult, are more difficult to make because you have to think of the gags and the jokes, but making them also makes you happier, and it's an also an escape for me. 同埋拍 comedy 嘅電影嘅 budget 唔會大嘅。The budget is always very low on comedy films. So, which means the bosses earn a, a lot of money and they make a profit. So, is it 變成咧就好容易就誒、啊、平衡到一啲好壓力嘅片又唔收錢啊！啊，去去去去支持到嗰、那個我哋製造電影嗰、那個嗰、那個可能性嘅。And because of that, it's easy to balance making a, a more personal film, which perhaps doesn't do well in, a, in the box office, with an easy to make romantic comedy, which does bring in the money in the box office and the commercial success. And there's the good balance there between the two. I wanted to ask about your perhaps coming back to your starting Milky Way Images in 1996 with Why Cafe. And Y Cafe is someone you've directed with, that you've produced with, and I wonder if you want to talk about or tell us a little bit about your relationship with Y Cafe and your filmmaking. 我誒成立誒銀河影像都係以韋家輝先生嗰個精神嘅。韋家輝先生嘅當時我哋成立嘅時候，我哋入佢係係喺個電影嗰個圈子裏邊咧。我哋成立嘅時候講咗就係我哋要原創嘅所有嘢，即係我會見到快啲。嗯，所以 the founding of Milky Way um is very much thanks to um Y Cafe's contribution. When we decided to make the company, um our main purpose was that we wanted to create original um products within the film industry. Everything had to be original from from us. 喺創作。創作嘅過程啊，一切嘅嘢咧，都係沿用啊韋家輝嘅嗰個概念嘅。So everything that we made from with Milky Way um was adhering to Y Cafe's principle of making everything original。嗯，我哋兩個合作拍電影嘅時候咧，就大部分嘅電影都會係誒，佢喺度創作嘅時候就我喺度拍緊嘅。So the way we collaborate usually when we work together is he would be um, writing and thinking about the stories while I am shooting and actually making the film. Because the majority of our films are made without any script. So as soon as he's finished writing, he, I would be on set already shooting. 所以我哋兩個拍緊戲嘅時候根本冇見過面嘅。So when we make a film together, we never see each other. <laughs> until 拍完咗之後。Until the, until we finished the film. <laughs> And so this kind of cues us to the next clip, which is from the film that you directed with Y Cafe, Mad Detective, which again I think was was one film that that many of us would have seen. And that film, when I first saw it, the the way in which we were inside the detective's mind and that we couldn't tell what was real and what was not. Um, and in the scene that we have queued up, um, the detective played by Ching Wen Lao um, is able to see the personalities inside the killer's mind as real people. And I thought perhaps we could uh, watch that clip and then See. Now, I think that that scene really shows us a certain style of filmmaking, that, that long shot, that very flattened side, but being able to see inside the mind and not being quite sure what we're looking at. Um, was that a difficult scene to shoot? How did you sh shoot that? Uh, <laughs> when Y Cafe first explained the scene to me, I didn't really understand. 
I I understood it as I was shooting it, so I still didn't really know what I was doing, and then eventually understood. And so one of the things about watching Mad Detective, I wasn't sure whether we were in a magic world where we could, where some people could see into people's minds, or whether we were in some other, you know, it, it, w it was just a way of explaining what was going on. Um, is the detective able to see something magical in other people? Because towards the end, when more and more people become involved in his mind, um, I think, um, even when I look at people today, um, I think you can see that some of them have two or three different faces. But then there are other people who have even more, and you just don't see them. They could have seven, eight, nine, ten, and you just don't see them. So, as a simple example, um, as a professor, as a teacher, say one of your students comes to talk to you and you have a discussion and you're arguing with each other, you finish the discussion and you both go your separate ways. What do you think you're thinking about each other as you walk away? You're most likely, you'll most likely be thinking, I wonder what they're thinking about me right now after everything we've said. You will very rarely be thinking about their face or what they look like uh, and their image. It'll be more, what are they thinking about me? What when we were thinking about making the film and when we were making it, we just thought it was um, the right symbol to show this would be to say how many ghosts or how many spirits do you have? Not how many characters, how many spirits. Mm. Mm. And I mean, throughout your films, people are often hiding, pretending to be somebody else, pretending. Um, I'm thinking about drug wars, where you know somebody is working. You know, double agents, triple agents, mm -hmm. undercover, not undercover, um, and that kind of concealing seems to really work cinematically, where you can't tell what. Um, or, or, you know, the question is, who is this person I'm looking at? Is that an issue that you think about a lot in your films? Who, what is the true person? Yeah. <coughs> yeah, this film wasn't meant to be like that, really. <laughs> <laughs> So being from the south, um, it never snows where we are. And we um, shot the film, we went to Tianjin in China to shoot the film, and what I wanted to show was the difference between the north and the south. And after two and a half months of shooting in Tianjin, not even a single drop of snow fell. But shooting went very slowly because it was extremely cold. Mm. 
廣州，廣州拍完就去雲南咁嘅，咁但係拍到天津都幾乎拍完曬啲錢。So originally, the film was meant to be shot in Tianjin, and then we were going to go to Wunan, and then to Guangzhou, and then to Wan Lam. But then, in the end, Yunnan, Yunnan, sorry, Yunnan. And then, in the end, uh, by the time we would finish in Tianjin, we'd almost run out of the budget. So the story changed because of that as we went along. So the story changed because of that as we went along. So I answered your question. So I can't really answer that question properly. <laughs> but working in this kind of free way, I mean, over your, your, many of your films, you use many of the same actors. You see the same actors coming up, you know, mm -hmm. Simon, Simon <laughs> Yam, yeah. Lam Suet, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all of... So, and you keep the, the, this group of, 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 of actors with you. How, how does that work for you? Do you like working with, well, obviously you like working with the same people. How do you work with them and how do they contribute to your film? It's because I'm lazy. Because I don't really like to spend too much time and communicating and getting to know someone. So, as a actor, he should be so as an actor, they should be able to um, play many different characters. Unless they don't like playing a certain character. And because we don't ever have a script when we start shooting, a lot of actors wouldn't accept that. So I keep using the same actors who accept that fact of how I work. <laughs> and yeah, uh, it, is, it is always extraordinary to see the same faces doing something else, very different, but also very familiar um, in your films. And I think it's one of the great joys of what, watching your films. Clearly, there are themes and ideas about honor, brotherhood, loyalty that, that come up over and over again. Um, but I wonder, looking at, looking at our time, I'm, I'm sure the audience may want to um, um, come in. And I think we won't have a roving mic. So I might repeat your question just to make sure that everybody's heard it. Um, and so if there's any questions from the floor, perhaps we can move on to that and we can. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, I wanted to ask about the visuals of your films and the sound, the sound, music, cutting, movement of actors, movement of the camera. Well, at what stage do you yeah. begin to think about this? Yeah, so the question is, at what stage do you start thinking about the visual style of your film, editing and the way that sound is going to work? I don't prepare any of it as I don't have a script. So none of that is prepared. Uh, I do think a lot all the time. I have lots of different ideas. But I don't actually decide on anything until I'm actually on location on set. So so all of the ideas, um, the, the only real one happens or comes to life when I'm on set. So I could say both in both terms, I have a lot of preparation, but also absolutely no preparation whatsoever. But I think a lot However, in, in terms of music, I'm, I don't know music very well. But I will research myself what type of music I think is appropriate for this film and tell the composer.
design a history back on subjects such as the making art. And the second one is about the, the ending of the film. Uh, we know that uh, uh, most of the film like uh, from election, uh, life or without principles or uh, life or principles, we have a different uh, ending in the Ch uh, Chinese mainland, uh, mainland of China version. So I'm just curious how the, how it works. So if the censorship commitment uh, just uh, tell you you should have uh, such an ending or you choose that one and show them, see whether they are satisfied, how it works. Okay, so the first question is the um, the totem or the stick in election, whether that is a historical fact. If you know the film, the triads um, passed on the stick to the next leader, and whether that is historical fact. Okay, so within the triads, not every single tribe has the dragon head stick, but the tribe I was talking about did. It's actual historic fact. But I've never seen what it looks like. <laughs> the one in the film was just an invention, it's fake. No one's seen it. Only, only the big boss, the big leader of the tribe would have it. It's probably very ugly if you really saw it. <laughs> and then the second and, uh, one is yes. that I only have one version. There is one version. So I only ever have one version in my head. It's my version of the film. After that, if things have to be done for in terms of censorship or box office reasons or whatever the reasons are. I don't want to know about it and I don't know anything about it. I've been to China. I watched one of my own films in China and didn't know what on earth the film was about. I thought, what is this? <laughs> it wasn't my film. Yes, over there. general question about um, film culture in Hong Kong, there's a bit of a longer question than that, but um, to what extent is, is cinema still part of your thinking? So Hong Kong cinemas are still surviving, but Hong Kong films are definitely on in the decline, declining. Uh, I would say that the Union Movement is a very important thing. Why do you have the Union Movement first? Why do you have the Union Movement first? So the Umbrella Revolution, um, which happened in Hong Kong last year, um, I think was a very, very important historical moment. Um, and we have to ask ourselves, why did that happen? Where did that come from? Um, out of the blue, um, this happened. Um, but I do think it was an inevitable event. And what the conclusion is, we still don't really know um, what will happen after the Umbrella Revolution.
if there's anything going to be about the umbrella re- revolution in your coming films. Uh, so I haven't made election three yet. <laughs> so it hasn't ended yet. <laughs> and I definitely will make something about that. I really want to make a point about that. Great. Yes? Um, I was just, uh, this is a question actually on behalf of my brother, who is a huge fan of uh, Mr. Tu. Um, and in the trailer to uh, election two, there was some footage uh, relating to an execution of a character by the People's Liberation Army, which didn't appear in the film. Um, and the question was whether uh, that was a political decision or whether it was uh, the Chinese censors or whether that's just reading um, too much into it. I have no idea. No memory of that. We'll uh, we'll have to bring your brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Okay, so I learned how to um, survive. <laughs> and this is a, a question about TVB, the um, television um, yeah. yes. uh, station, that uh, oh, television production unit that uh, Mr. Toe started working with. The, the time in my life where I've had the least hours, numbers of uh, uh, numbers of hours of sleep is when I worked for TVB. So when I was making Lok Siu Fung, which was 1976, I went for seven days without sleeping. Uh, so in 1984, near 1985, um, there was one month where I'd slept in total 20 hours. Because the TV channels used to be used to be at war with each other all the time. And every time they would call me out to sort it, sort it out. out. So what did I learn from TV work? How to survive? Yeah. So, <laughs> so I don't know uh, you got me. Uh, uh, me. Uh, 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 or not needing to work uh, with a script making a film. And Mr. To answered, it's not that I don't need a script, I just don't have one.
or do you employ script writers? Yeah. Okay. Good. Question finished? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Too long. <laughs> 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 Our company has employed a lot of screen uh, screenwriters, script writers, but none of them are good enough. So in the last seven or eight years, um, we've had a lot of uh, graduates from university have come and worked at our company, um, and we've always had about two to three um, working there. But after they enter the company, they become more and they enter the company, they become more and more scared. Because they realize that the four years they've just spent at university were useless. Because whatever I tell them to do, they find it to be wrong or controversial. So a question about um, whether international direct, what interac- international directors have influenced? Kurosawa. Kurosawa is a massive influence. The biggest. Yeah, in fact, um, we were talking about, um, and, and I've completely blanked which, but uh, actually coming to PTU, which we'll come back come, come back yeah, to in yeah. a bit, where where it's almost a reference to Stray Dog with the Lost Gun, um, Kurosawa's <coughs> film, and and you know some of your films are explicit homages. I think Throwdown, yeah. which you often talk it's about true. as one of your, is, is is dedicated to Kurosawa yeah. as well. And what about can, perhaps building on that contemporary cinema? Are there any filmmakers you see working now, either in Hong Kong or in the world, that you particularly like or recommend? No, just Wai Ka Fai. I'm not interested. <laughs> Great, down here. Okay, so that in Hong Kong films, the triads are presented really through questions of brotherhood and loyalty, whereas perhaps outsiders looking in presented in terms of flash and, and cars and money and all the rest of it. It's actually the same. But the clothing tastes are different. Just that the, their clothing tastes are different. <laughs> they do they do wear expensive clothes. It's just that they've made a lot of money, but they just don't know how to spend it. Even a beautiful car, flashy car, they don't know how to really go and buy one or drive it. The aim is the same. Same. And actually, just following up on that, would you say that in Hong Kong today, the triads are part of everyday life, or that normal people would be aware or work with triad members or within the triad system in some way? Or so 
So the, the very fact that the tries have, have existed for so long means that you have the Hong Kong society has now become used to the way they are and, and how they are. For example, if you see a triad member walking down the street to you, you just cross the street and you do it automatically and it's a part of your everyday life. So when the triads were very powerful and very strong, everybody around them in, in Hong Kong society and the population will learn how to adapt and live with them. So the triads um, usually bully the most vulnerable, so the people who are uh, the poorest um, and have no defences. They don't have the courage to go and challenge the richest and the most powerful people. They won't run up to the peaks of Hong Kong and challenge the people living in the big houses there. They don't, they're not brave enough. To what extent has sleep deprivation and hallucinations resulting therefrom influenced your work? Yes, he did have hallucinations and psychological problems. But it turns out that sometimes the more pressure you're under, you simply forget to sleep. Because when you're doing something and you simply don't have enough time to do it, you're constantly chasing and trying to catch up and you can't even think about sleeping. But if you happen to have one or two hours where you're stopping, to, you don't have anything to do and you're not working, then your entire body shuts down and collapses. So very often I would go home and as soon as I got home my wife would um, tell me to take a bath and then as soon as I had the bath she would throw me into the car with all of my things because she was really worried that if I actually lay down on the bed I wouldn't get up again. Yes. Whether martial arts films, which of course the heroic trio with Maggie Chung and the barefoot um, kid, uh, whether you're going to come back to this genre? Definitely would like to make more. But, uh, they're a lot easier to make now because there's so much CGI. So there should be a lot more, uh, there should be a lot better than the olden day Because in the past you could only make something that an actual human being could do, but now you don't have to worry about that limitation. Uh, Spider-Man and the Batman. <laughs> <laughs> And actually, have you found the change from working with analog film, with, with celluloid, to digital, have you found that easy or problematic? Uh, more easy. Hmm. It's a lot easier, but I, I don't think it looks as good. I prefer looking at analog. Hmm. Hmm. Sorry, there's a question here. Uh, 
Yes, a question about um, interviews that, that Mr. Cho did with, with real policemen and to what extent those, uh, those interviews influenced his work. The police will very rarely tell you the truth. <laughs> I would always go to the triad to ask them what the police were like and what the police really did, and that triads tell the truth, the police don't. So when we ask the police officers, um, do you hit the criminals? Are you allowed to hit them? And they would answer, no, it's not, we're not allowed to. It's illegal. We can't hit criminals. But then you go and ask the boy they've just beaten up and, and the gangster members, and they say, and I say, do the cops beat you up? And they say, as soon as we get to the police station, they beat you up. They beat you up until you speak. So who do you believe? Right over here. question about the influence of Jean-Pierre Melville, the, um, the 1950s and 60s French director of the policier, and obviously a great influence of any many of So Melville is definitely amongst my favorite directors, but the most favorite is definitely Kurosawa. Uh, Pat Sparrow, he so Sparrow was influenced by the Jacques Demi film. Jack Demi yeah, film. Umbrella of Cheval. Mm-hmm. Fantastic film. Yeah. Fantastic film. In the back there. Yes, you. Uh, I've got two questions. The first one is quite general, the second one is very specific. The first one is uh, Does Mr. Tone read European and North American critics who regularly describe him as one of the world's great directors? Does he think that he reads those reviews? Liam or I don't know English, so I don't read it. <laughs> if someone reads it and tells me, then I'll know, but otherwise not. Uh, uh so I feel very, very lucky already that um, I can make so many films from such a place as Hong Kong, such a small little island like Hong Kong, and get to uh, travel the world and come to lots of different places and see diff- lots of different film festivals and come to Edinburgh, Scotland for the very first time and come to a room like this and see so many people sitting here and you haven't left. Um, <laughs> so I don't need to see the critics and the reviews, I just need to look at you. And you had a specific question. Yeah, the second question was about uh, horse racing in Hong Kong, which is a big source of money and uh, Hong Kong jockey club. Have you ever made a film which is about the world of horse racing in Hong Kong? And if not, would you do that? 
the world of horse racing in Hong Kong. And, uh, if, I did, if I wasn't a filmmaker, I would always be a, at the horse jockey club um, betting on horses. Uh, I think the, dif- the biggest difficulty would be actually shooting the horses. Yeah. And the, the grounds, it would be difficult to actually make the grounds. I do find it a very mystical place, the horse ground. All people from all walks of life are there. It's just like everyday society outside of that. So what I really like about horse racing um, is the the actual um, the combination and the coming together of the jockey and the horse and the movement and the strength and the teamwork that it takes to move maneuver themselves around the race course um, and I find that very beautiful. Especially the sounds, the hooves on the ground, uh, the sounds of the race course. <laughs> and the tension when horses get very close together, it's not a simple um, no, matter. Simple. People could die. And of and course, do. perhaps to tie this all together, tension, a group working together, sound, we're going to move into the final clip um, um, to end um, our discussion here, which is from 2003's PTU, Police Tactical Unit, um, and clearly, um, one of the, the things that we all know Johnny Toe's films for are the spectacular shootout scenes. So we thought we'd end with the very famous final shootout from PTU. So thank you very much to Johnny Toe.